Welcome to In Conversation. Welcome to the studio audience here and to our friends on Facebook Live. Please like our page. Please give us hearts. Please share this conversation. You will not want to miss the wisdom of our guest. It is my privilege to welcome casting director Billy DeMota to the studio. I've known Billy for <coughs> We were just counting. Yes, it's more than my fingers yes. will yeah will do yeah. Uh, for quite a while, and he has been a tireless advocate for actors, and so strong in terms of supporting actors on a proper path of their craft, and not to try to sell themselves in all the different ways and all the different scams that are out there. So I am delighted to have him here and we're going to be asking you questions. Please send them in on Facebook. I have questions here from the live audience and some questions that I'm curious about. Oh, good. So first is your origin story, Billy. From whence did you come? Oh, um, started a long time ago. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. I think we talked about that before. And I was a rock and roll guitar player. I played in a lot of bands in San Francisco and I, I, uh, uh, I wanted to move to Los Angeles so I could be a big rock and roll guitar god uh, because this is where all the music was happening. And I moved here in 1970, end of 1974, uh, and then disco happened. So they kind of screwed Don't up. Don't look my, at me. I know, no, no, it's, not your, it's not your fault. I love disco. Yeah. But it kind of, it screwed up my live music career because all the bands were playing at these, all the, all the more popular bands were playing at the clubs and the smaller bands were now being sort of edged out by the by the, the people that were spinning records. So I got into the retail business. Actors wait tables when they're not working and, and musicians sell stuff because it's a, it's a good uh, kind of a gig to, the hours are great. So and the money's okay too. So I got very successful as a, uh, as a shoe salesman and as a, as a clothing salesman. I sold insurance for a while. I sold pens on the telephone at four o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, and then I got into the car business in 1981 or 82, and uh, I was uh, in the sales department at Beverly Hills Porsche Alley, and I was selling cars to movie stars and Playboy bunnies and uh, and making a lot of money and driving a really fancy car and hating my life because I had moved away from my art. I was moving further and further away from my music, and uh, in 1985, I met a woman uh, who was casting a big studio movie. She had just done Breakfast Club, and she did The Mask with, uh, with Eric Stoltz and Cher, and she was just starting a, an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called Commando. And I said to her, I know I'm in the car business, but I'm an artist, I like movies, and I like people, I can put them together, how do you do what you do? She said, come work for me, for free. <laughs> so, so I did, I interned with her for uh, about six months and then she put me on the payroll and we worked on three Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, Commando, uh, Predator, The Running Man, we also did movies like Three Amigos, which is, uh, there's always a giggle in the audience because it's, it's such a funny movie and one of my favorite experiences. Uh, hanging out on the set with a, a brand new uh, Martin Short who'd really never been you know, in a big movie before and this was his sort of, he was so excited and, and uh, Steve Martin of course, much shyer than I ever thought he was because you know, he's, uh, he's on stage, he's a crazy man and you know, behind the scenes he's a very sort of sober and quiet fellow. And Chevy Chase who was going through some chemical issues at the time that he was resolving, uh, and, and rightfully so, and he did a good job, but, but uh, was a, a little harder to get to know, but that was a great movie to work on. And working with, uh, with some of the, it was Lauren Michaels who produced it, just a terrific film to work on. And uh, after, uh, after my stint as a casting assistant, I started on a movie called Colors, which was uh, my first sort of associate, you know, more responsibility in casting credit, uh, working with a woman named Lauren Lloyd. Uh, and uh, 
was a uh, Colors If You Don't Know was the movie that starred Sean Penn and Robert Duvall and uh, was directed by Dennis Hopper. An amazing experience hanging out on the streets of uh, South Los Angeles at 2 o'clock in the morning with Dennis Hopper and a Polaroid camera. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Uh, and um, I did a Mir Miracle Mile, which was my first independent film by myself with uh, Anthony Edwards and Mayor Winningham. Um, I uh, did Steven Seagal's first film when he was kind of a nice guy, uh, <laughs> called Above the Law, which was a, a lot of fun to work on, with Sharon Stone. Uh, and I've gone on to cast 100 and 200 movies since then, mostly independent stuff. Uh, I uh, cast a TV show called America's Most Wanted for about 20 years, Catching Bad Guys, which was a lot of fun, uh, and put a lot of actors to work in Los Angeles, which was a great, great thing for me. Um, and, uh, and now I'm playing rock and roll again. <laughs> I mean, I've always, I, it, I've always sort of dabbled with it, but I have a, our, our band is terrific. I play with a, a band called Shelley O'Neill and The Big Way, and uh, we've been together for about 20 years, so still playing. So great. Please send us your questions on Facebook Live. Good morning to our studio in Australia, where it is Sunday, and we hope to get your questions as well. Hi, Phil Evans. David Corey, they're there. Hello from up over. <laughs> <laughs> or over easy. Uh, Billy, do headshots still matter, and what makes a good headshot? Yes, they still matter. I was just with uh, a fellow named AJ, I don't know if you know AJ Jaberry, who's a headshot photographer. I was just with him at UCLA, uh, where we did a seminar together. And um, sometimes we forget about how important headshots are. We, the, you have to remember they're your business card as actors, uh, and when that headshot lands on my desk or when we see it on, on online in, in a submission, um, we have to be able to connect to it right away. Uh, you know, sort of the mail-in headshots are not as critical as they used to be because of the, the way we the way we communicate nowadays. But uh, the, the the quality of the headshot and the connection with the actor's eyes, which is the window to their soul, uh, is critical. So we look at a lot of headshots. When uh, I just spoke with Dee earlier today, my partner Dee Weiss, uh, who is casting a film where she's got 20,000 submissions and she's looking at all the thumbnails. So we look at every picture. I know that sounds crazy, but we do. And clicking through the pages, there's 100 thumbnails on a page. And if your photograph is less than stellar, if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's not well shot, if, it's, if, it's, if you send in a body shot or even a three-quarter shot uh, for a thumbnail, your head is about the size of the, the head of a pin. Um, we may pass you <coughs> so I think it's critical to have a really great headshot by it doesn't, you don't have to spend a million dollars but uh, you know don't uh, do your headshots on your iPhone or have your friend take them have somebody do your professional headshots in a studio where they control the light and they can control the vibe and you can relax and you can get a real good representation of who you are as a human being because that's what we're trying to see in the photograph is your is your essence your soul your your uh, your essence as an actor so and as a human being so make sure that the headshots are, are always top of your list do you have a preference black and white or color or does that not matter you know it's funny because <laughs> when black and white were the thing up until 10 or 15 years ago every headshot was black and white um, you kind of got used to that uh, format. And then color headshots, because they became less expensive to print, became the norm. And now I kind of like the black and white shots because you can, you can get a little more artistic with the, with the, uh, with the lighting and with the, uh, the contrast. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of black and white just because I, I take black and white photographs and I shoot on film. And, uh, and I kind of miss that. But, I think in order to get to sort of work with the way the market works right now, I think you have to have color headshots. 
And this is from Phil Evans of our Australian studio. Good morning, Phil. Phil. He has a headshot follow-up question. Hmm. What do you think of character headshots? I think they're okay. Um, but they must be used in a very specific manner. Uh, I think that to send a casting director a bunch of different headshots is kind of nuts. I think what you have to do is make sure that anything that you submit is character specific. So if you're submitting for a homeless guy, of course you will have, you won't s submit the, the photograph with the suit and tie. If you're submitting for a stripper, you won't do the business suit. So uh, character shots are good, but you have to be very specific and make sure that you only sub use them for the specific characters that you're submitting for. Um, I'm not crazy about uh, some of the really wacky character ones. I mean, I think we should be able to use our imagination as casting directors. Um, but, uh, but I think character shots are okay. I mean, I, I, if there, there's a role for that character, you should have a headshot for it. Resumes, is there any particular form? What should be first? Uh, well, in Los Angeles, of course, it's film, television, theater, commercials uh, upon request, uh, and uh, special skills, the training in special skills, of course. Uh, and uh, in, in New York, I think it's a little bit different. I'm not really familiar with New York. <coughs> People tell me that theater is often first in an, on a New York resume. Does it, anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, because you know, there's more theater work that goes on there. And sometimes people will list a lot of their commercials that they do because there's a lot of commercials that go on there. But um, it's pretty standard format. Uh, um, to anybody who hasn't put together their resume. Film, television, theater, training, and special skills. Pretty much it. When an actor comes in, just for the interview portion, to chit chat with you, what are the turn-ons and turn-offs, just in discussion? Don't try too hard. Mm -hmm. I think actors tend to be sort of overzealous sometimes when they come in and they meet with a casting director because if you think about it, uh, you have so few auditions as it is. And when you sit in front of a casting director, whether you meet with them or you come in to audition for them, a lot of times your nerves control your behavior. And what you can do is you, you can kind of talk your way out of a job sometimes by being too chatty or, or being inappropriately uh, friendly when it doesn't need to be that. Uh, I had an actor walk in to my office last week. So, uh, so how are the cats doing? And uh, wow, you still ride the motorcycle? And uh, and you know there was a sort of a nervous energy there, and you kind of feel it. It's like I don't, you don't need to ask. You know, it's nice that you're being friendly, but come in, do your work, and go away. And, and, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I love to be able to connect with actors, and I think your personality. Your, your nature as a human being is really important to me. I mean, it's, to me, it's one of the, the paramount things I look for in an actor is the way that I connect with their personality. Uh, that having been said, it's like any other s social situation. You know, whenever you meet somebody, try to be natural, try to be honest, try to be uh, likable, um, and uh, I think you'll do well. Please like our page, please give us hearts, please share this conversation. Anybody in the entertainment industry will want to hear from casting director Billy Demoda. We're taking questions from the live audience and also from <laughs> Facebook. Just give a heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In terms of preparation, when you are casting something, what do you expect from the actor? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, people ask me often, what are your pet peeves? And my biggest pet peeve is an actor who's unprepared. There's a reason there's a book called An Actor Prepares. Uh, because a lot of actors don't. Your job as an actor, always, is to understand that character before you walk into my office. And to make specific choices, strong specific choices. Sometimes you make the wrong choices. Sometimes they're not exactly on on the button but the fact that I'm I'm watching you doing the work 
watching you being able to create a character and make solid choices is what, is what makes me the happiest. When you walk in, and I've had actors walk in and say, so uh, is this a period piece, or is this a, is a, is this a contemporary thing, or is this day or night, or, or uh, sorry, I just got the material because I just drove from across town. And, like, don't come into my office unprepared because there are far too many actors in this town that are prepared, that will come in 100% prepared and ready to, to give you the best performance they can. And again, it may not always be exactly the right choices, but it's somebody that's come in and you can see they've done the work in creating a character and making solid choices, really sinking their teeth into something. And that, to me, is really important. Have you seen an actor recover from making a mistake? Yes, I have. However, I must say that, that, that I think I'm more, I don't know if I, I'm more forgiving than, than maybe some casting directors are. Because if I see that they have a talent, then I understand sometimes they're, you know, it's when it's 105 degrees outside and they've driven across the world to get to my office and they can't find a place to park and they're five minutes late and they have to pee and <laughs> they come into my office and they kind of choke a little bit. It's sort of, I can see it. And I'll say, do me a favor, go outside, have a glass of water, pee, and uh, relax a little bit. Take five minutes, I'll bring somebody in before you and then I'll have you come in. But the problem is in Los Angeles, it's become such a numbers game that so many so many actors walk into a room and there are 40 other actors exactly like them reading for the same role. Our job, of course, is to find the right actor, but our, our, our job is also not to see a million people to find that one perfect person. I think because we've been around for so long, we've found so many great actors and met so many great actors and worked with so many great actors over the years that, um, that we, uh, that we don't have to bring as many actors in, and, uh, uh, and not that we don't see new actors, but our process is, is, is not a numbers game, it's a quality game. So, uh, yeah, so the question is, yes, we ha actors have recovered, but I think that it, the, the casting directors also need to be super aware of what's happening in that actor's space when they walk into their office. And sometimes, sometimes there's not that, that, that connection. Anyway. Understood. Uh, this is from someone who's present. So stand. Where's Allison Chen? There she is. Hi. Hi. Do you think racial inclusion is breaking down typecasting, uh, specifically Asian typecasting? Who are you asking for? <laughs> She's asking for me. <laughs> uh, yes, the answer is yes to that. Um, you know, there used to be a time when I first started in this business, 33 years ago, that uh, that the pendulum was so swung so far toward the the you know the white male uh, you know cop or judge or lawyer or whatever, and now uh, it has thankfully swung the other way, uh, where Asian and, and African American and South Asian and uh, even Native American and the, the, all cultures are being represented in television and film more than ever. And I think what's happening is because the, the creative community in, in Hollywood is younger and more diverse and is recognizing the fact that, uh, that casting should always represent the real world. It wasn't, hasn't always been like that. Thankfully, you know, we've been lucky enough to work with the kind of producers and directors over the years that have allowed us to sort of tweak a character. If it says the judge is uh, 55 and white and male, we bring in a 35-year-old black woman or a 70-year-old Asian woman or, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be that uh, to reflect the real world. We've been lucky enough to be able to cast to reflect the real world. I think that's what's happening now. I think it's a great time for ethnic talent. Um, I mean, if it's ever a great time for any talent in Hollywood to get a job, because it's always tough, but, uh, but yes, I think the opportunities are there, and I think you need to embrace them, and you need to find good representation to get you out in front of the right 
people to get that work. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. This is from Facebook. It's from Andy Osho. Hi, Andy. She might be in London at the moment. Uh, do you take actors' social media into consideration when you're casting? I don't. Uh, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, I think too much emphasis has been placed on social media. I know that uh, there be, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a 19 year old Instagram star and I don't have a million Twitter followers, uh, but I, I use social media, uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram for personal use. I don't, I don't use it as a, as a casting tool and I don't know that most casting directors do either. And I think sometimes, uh, sometimes we get a little confused because I'll get a, a directive from a producer or director that says, um, yeah, we like her, but make, let's see how many Twitter followers she has. Uh, if she doesn't have as many Twitter followers, are we gonna go with that actor who's a better actor, or are we gonna go with the one who has a few more Instagram numbers, a higher IMDb rating, or a, or more you know Facebook friends. Uh, so sometimes your the talent can kind of get lost in the mix. So I try to stay away from it. I try to think about casting from a, purely a, a, a talent standpoint. Uh, and if they happen to have great numbers, that that makes my uh, uh, producers and director happy and distributors. That's great. But I'll always argue. Uh, and fight for the talent uh, uh, over the one who has you know, a million Twitter followers, right? Please send us your questions on Facebook. Please like our page, share our page. Let everybody know about this in conversation with the wonderful casting director, Billy DeMota. This is from our own Ian Cardoni. It's right there. Hey. When bringing new actors in today, what carries more weight for you on a resume, credits or training? Uh, you know, it depends on the kinds of credits. Training is always paramount for me. When I look at a resume, that's my eyes go down to that part of the resume. I'm going to tell you a funny story. It has to do with a guy named Howard Fine. <laughs> <laughs> when I was well, probably right around 35 years old, I was in the middle, I was just, it was three or four years into casting. And uh, there was a period of time when an actor would come into my office, and they were so good, and I would flip the resume over, and it would say Howard Fine. Over and over again, this happened, and I'm not joking. I, I, I called Howard's studio, and I said, what the hell are you doing down there? <laughs> and he said, well, come down and audit. You, you know, Monday night, you can come and you sit and fly on the wall. So I went down on a, I think it was a Monday night, and I sat back, and after the class, and I, and I had spoken to a few people in the class, and some of them were brand new to the business, or had just moved here from another city, or were, had never really been in, in, a, in an acting class before. And they were all amazing, and I, and, I, and I went to Howard after class, and I said, how do you do this? How do you get this thing from these actors? And he said, take my class. <laughs> uh, I said, uh, no, no, I'm a, I'm a casting director. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't need to take a class. I'm a, he says, take my class. And that could have been 1989. It was 1989. <laughs> he said, take my class, and you'll understand what happens inside of an actor's head. You will know more about actors uh, than any other casting director out there. Of course, he always tried to convince me to give up <laughs> casting. <laughs> he was really good. <laughs> but I leave that to the professions. So the point is, is that since then, not only have I become a better casting director, but I've become a better judge of character. I've been a, uh, better, become a better judge of talent. And the first place I look is where they study. That doesn't always make them the best actor in the world, but it makes me, it helps me understand what their commitment is to their craft. If I see that they've studied with any teacher that I've recognized or studied at all. I mean, there are actors that don't even have their training on their resume or are not in a class. And I don't get that. So that's the first place I look. 
if they have big feature credits, this guy they must be doing something right. Uh, but uh, but the training's always uh, important to me. That's good. Thank you, brother. Sure. Uh, Alexis, where are you? Is she here? Oh, she might have tipped out. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, Alexis, I've been told often to emphasize my ethnic look more. Being of Mexican American descent, but not fluent in Spanish. Is it sound advice to only go for the Mexican roles, as I've been told? That's what casting directors will cast me as. Uh, no. Uh, I think you should uh, always go for whatever you can play. Um, you know, sometimes you you may look Mexican, stereotypically Mexican, whatever that is. Um, but uh, but if you can play. American, if you can play European, if you can play Filipino or 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 you know Russian or Mediterranean, you shouldn't keep yourself from going out for those roles. If they need specific language skills, then that's a different story. Uh, but uh, you should always go out for whatever you can play. Um, and if if you don't speak fluent Spanish. Then you know you might be doing shooting yourself in the foot, going out for the roles that other people go out for when they can speak perfect Spanish. So uh, don't limit yourself. I, I think actors um, put themselves in a box sometimes, and it's not that I I'm not crazy about branding and about stereotyping or typing, uh, but I think you have to know what you can play. Uh, but I also think you have to understand that. When, as an actor, uh, you know we're we're often called upon to do things that that are sometimes outside of our box ethnically, and uh, you find out it may work sometimes if you try it. So I don't sell yourself short and just go out for the roles that you your agent thinks you're right for, uh, if you think you can do other stuff. What makes a good agent in your book? What do you think? I wonder if any agents are watching. There, there are. I can assure you there are. Uh, an, an agent has to have a, a personal connection with each one of their clients. Uh, even if you have a big roster, and, and if, you, if you can't connect with your talent, if you don't understand what they can do uh, as an actor, uh, then uh, you're, you're, you're not doing yourself a service as an agent because you're not recognizing what what you know what your talent can do and an actor you're suffering because you're not being represented represented in the right way. So you remember you have to remember a talent representative represents you. So they have to be inside your head. They have to know what you can do. Um, too many agents have a big roster and it's it's just a number game. They throw out a lot of talent. Uh, and uh, and see what sticks, and um, and sometimes are not uh, specific with the way they submit people. My favorite agents are the ones that call me on the telephone, and they know who they are. You know who you are. Uh, hi, you have to meet Jimena. She's awesome. She's from Argentina, and she's and she speaks fluent Spanish, but she speaks fluent English too. And she just got tapped heart lead, and she uh, and she's um, uh, and she's ready to work. That's, I'm gonna see that actor if they call me and they pitch him because I wanna trust that agent to be able to send me great actors in the future if I need people. So it's that personal relationship you connect, uh, you have with agents, the connection that, uh, that helps me become a better casting director because I, you know, the, the agent knows. The agent knows who their good talent is and I wanna be able to know that. Nobody pitches anymore. So it's hard for me to so, you know, I have to do a little bit more research and dig a little bit more, which I don't mind doing, but I love it when an agent or a manager calls me and pitches their talent. About managers, do actors need agents and managers, and what are your feelings? Um, no. I think, an, I think agents and managers pretty much do the same thing now. Uh, agents uh, with a big roster are, uh, you know, I mean, managers with a big roster are basically acting like, like agents, and they're submitting. How many people here have uh, managers? Does your manager submit you for work? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. They're not supposed to, technically, but they do. And, and I, I have no feeling either way. I think it's fine. But, uh, but they're acting as your agent, basically. They're, they're representing you. They're submitting you. They probably work your, 
they do your deal for you, if you book a job. Uh, so if they do specific, different specific things, then that's, then yes, have an agent and a manager. For instance, if you have an agent and you need your manager to handle your personal stuff, your, your, your styling and your, 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 your social media and your, uh, and your, your finances and your other things that, that managers used to typically do, sort of babysit their clients, uh, and you should have a much smaller roster if you're a manager, uh, then yeah, have a manager and an agent. But I don't think you need both. I think in the beginning of your career, you need one good, strong representative, whether it's an agent or a manager. Please like our page. Please give us hearts. Please share this. We have our guest, casting director Billy DeMota. This is from Anthony Manassi. So, right there. How do you feel about receiving postcards? Um, this is my personal opinion. I'm not crazy about them. Uh, Dee, my partner, loves them. She tacks them all over her <laughs> office. Uh, but I have to tell you that they can be effective. D uh, about, uh, I guess, the last movie we were working on, we used to get a postcard from uh, this woman every probably six weeks. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy St. Patty's Day. Happy April Fool's. Hope you're having a great summer. I just booked a job on, on ABC's uh, Friday Night Watch Me. I just signed with a new talent agent. I just, we've never met this woman. But it's like advertising. Yeah. In the sense that the more you see a particular advertisement, a commercial, the more you're familiar with that product and the more you want to know more about it. She picked up the card and she said, hey, you know, we know her, don't we? Let's, can we bring her in for, for the role of whatever in the project we're working on? She came in and she read and she booked it. Um, and and it was, we never met her before, but it was because the postcards kept her in my mind. And, and Dee's mind, actually, because I, again, I'm not a huge postcard fan. Mm -hmm. She is, and I understand how effective they can be. So uh, just my opinion is, is, doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to send them. Uh, there's always an occasion for you to send them to. I think, like anything else, you have to be judicious in the way that you uh, approach the process and not send one every week. Uh, but if you do every six or eight weeks, I think you're good. And again, you're keeping yourself in front of the, the casting director's face. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Has it happened that you read an actor, really enjoyed their work, brought them to producers, and in some way they sabotaged themselves? Mm. Can we get another water for Bill? Mm -hmm. Not yet. I'm, um, I, yes, uh, I, it's happened a lot of times. And it happens mostly because the actor has changed their, their approach to the <coughs> character. What got them the callback is not what they're doing in the callback. So, I mean, I think this is pretty standard uh, advice for anybody that comes in to read for anything, for anybody is that if you get a call back, it's because they liked what you did. They thought your original audition was awesome. If they want you to change something, they'll tweak it for you. Don't do the casting director's job and assume that you know uh, more about the character and what the director wants, thank you so much, than the, uh, uh, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to trust the casting director if the casting director brings you back uh, and you um, and you change it up and you, I mean, I've, I've had people come in with different accents or cut their hair different or do weird, I mean, completely screw up their opportunity because they they got a little hook into what might be a, a job and they now they want to explore it and expand on it. Just dress the same, come in, do the same performance, don't change anything unless you're asked to do that. This is from Facebook. You've mentioned you were into music and that you've been on the directing and producing side as well. Is it important for actors to be a hyphenate actor, writer, director, etc.? Well, it's not important, but I think if you do it, uh, you should you, you should do it well. I, I, I'm. Somebody asked me if I was. I directed a movie called Posey about five years ago with Sally Kirkland. Ray Wise. And Hi, Sally. Hi, Sally. Uh, and um, 
and it was a terrific little film. Uh, and I realized when I started to direct the film, uh, I, well, first of all, I wrote the film, and I wasn't going to direct it, but then I couldn't find anybody that really understood the material as, as well as I did, so I decided to direct it. And then what happened is I became the executive producer, associate producer, co-producer. I micromanaged everything. You know, in my business, I have two or three employees. I, I can be a control freak, but being on a set with 100 people, which I had in this particular case, was a little tough for me. So my hyphenate from uh, casting director, director, <coughs> went away really fast. Uh, if I could just show up on the set and, and yell action and cut and go home, I would do that. So yes, being a hyphenate is okay, but you have to be able to love and be really good at whatever your hyphenate is. If you're an actor, gourmet chef, you better be cooking like a mobile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you're an actor writer, uh, you better be writing stuff. You better be writing stuff, and you better have stuff to show what you do as a, as a writer. Uh, but you got to do it well, uh, just like acting. You would never call yourself a, an actor unless you were well trained, unless you were ready to do it and compete with the other great actors out there. So, yes, it's okay to be a hyphenate, but you should be good at what you you do. This is from Daniel, who's here. How important is networking? Well, that's important. Uh, I think you have to do it in the right way. I think developing genuine relationships is important. There are ways, and we've seen it in the past, where you could pay your way into an audition or a meeting. Uh, but I always said that, that that kind of networking, paying to meet a casting assistant to become a successful you actor. You have opinions about that. Right? <laughs> I, I, I have no. But paying, paying a casting assistant to get a job uh, to, or, or to, to, to develop a relationship is like going to a whorehouse to find a wife. <laughs> <laughs> might work. I might work. never know. Probably not going to be a very long-lasting relationship. <laughs> the fact is, is the, the, the point I'm making, and I joke, but, but developing genuine relationships is really important. Um, connecting with people on a, on, a, on a human level is really important. Um, and you can do that in a lot of different venues. I mean, you can invite people to come see your, your production, at, you know, your theater show, your show. Um, and the, the casting directors that show up are there because they want to be. You want to develop relationships with people that want to know you. You know what I mean? That want to that want to know who you are and that want to connect with you. So networking is important, but you got to do it in the right way. And I can't, there's a million different ways to do it. I can't tell you how, but uh, you know, no stalking. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps doing theater in town? Theater's great, yeah. Um, uh, doing, doing theater in, in Los Angeles is amazing. Uh, there are actors who put on their own showcases sometimes. There are uh, general interviews that are starting to happen more, I think. Uh, uh, so don't be afraid to have your agent or your manager, if you're represented, connect with the people that you want to meet in this business and say, you know, my client loves your work and would love to be able to sit down with you for five minutes. Can you come by the office and say hi? Oh, you, some of the old school casting directors will say yes in a second. Some of the newer TV casting directors you might have a harder time just because of time constraints. Uh, but even now, they're meeting more people than ever. So, uh, and also, you know, a little bit of homework that I give to everybody. You don't have to write it down, but it's 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 pretty it's pretty simple, and it's uh, uh, and it's I think something every actor should do. You have to identify where you want to be in this business as an actor in film or television or or theater, and then you have to identify the people that you want to connect with that can help open those doors for you. So, think of the five movies that you loved this year, and when I say loved, I don't mean the five movies that made you laugh or cry, but the five movies that. Tell me your name again. Daniel. Daniel. The, the, the five movies that you said, why the hell is Daniel not working in that movie? Why am I not working with that director? Why am I not working with those stars? Why am I not working in those kind of productions? You like Ang Lee and you like personal drama? You like Judd Apatow and wacky comedies? You like David Fincher and really dark, you know, kind of drama stuff? You like uh, Christopher Guest and kind of goofy movies? Find out who's 
casting those movies. Find out who is the, uh, who's the production company. Find out who the directors are for the movies. Find out who, you know, IMDb is your friend. If, not, if everybody here does not have IMDb, you're doing yourself a disfavor because connecting and networking is important, but you have to know how to find them and who's doing what. And sometimes you'll just get lost for hours on IMDb, and it's a lot of fun. I like it. Uh, and then you figure out how you get into their, on their radar. You call your agent or your manager, and you say, I love the, the casting director for David Fincher's movies. Um, Lorraine Mayfield happens to be who does all of his movies. How do I get on her radar? Have your agent make a call. Lorraine, he's a real big fan of yours, and he wants to get into your office. Can, is there a chance you can, uh, you can meet Daniel? Who knows? But that's that's where you have to start. So, and if you don't have an agent or manager, you know, Steve Martin had this old joke. He said, "How to be a millionaire and pay no taxes." <laughs> First, get yourself a million dollars. So that's the joke. The, the fact is that you have to you have to get that thing first. You have to have that agent or the manager to be able to open those doors. But how do you get the agent or manager uh, until those doors are open? So a lot of times it's this, this crazy circle where you have to. Uh, you know, you have to work hard to get all the pieces together. But if you have a good agent manager who's representing you properly, they can open the doors for you. And they should, and they will. But you're really advocating the actor do their homework. Oh, yes, to absolutely. See what they want to do where they right. fit. It talk, it's your own, you have to identify who you are as an actor and where you want to, how you fit in to the Hollywood puzzle, where you, where you see yourself, uh, you know, working. You want to do, you know, big comedies and in, in, in movies, you want to do a sitcom, you want to do a daytime drama, figure out where you fit, and then you'll figure out who's doing those things so you can figure out how to approach them and network with them. Great. Please send us your questions on Facebook. We're taking questions from the live audience. Please like our page, share our page, and share this brilliant in conversation. This is from Facebook. The way an actor submits for auditions has changed rapidly with online, etc. How has your day-to-day -day changed, and what's typical in a day for you when you're casting? Um, well, there's a lot of different elements to casting, but when you're talking about submission specifically, you know, we put a breakdown out, and we're the kind of casting directors who almost always put a breakdown out on actors' access as well as the standard breakdowns because we like to sort of see everybody that's out there. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, first is because Actors Access shows us people who are, that we've never met before, that are not necessarily represented by talent agents that call us and pitch people to us. They're the rank and file actors that are out there looking for a gig, an acting job. So we get a chance to, to see more of who's out there. And yes, it's a lot more work, but I think as casting directors, we do a better job as casting directors the more people that we know and the more options and choices that we have. Uh, the other reason is because there are times that, that actors are between agents, and they'll see our job, and they'll say, hey, Billy, just wanted to let you know that I'm still around. Somebody who was an actor who we worked with in the past we may have forgotten or has fallen through the cracks. So it's good for us to, to, to release everything through Actors Access for that reason. But having said that, we get 20,000 submissions on the job. So it's a, it's time, it's time because it's not like opening envelopes it used to be. You know, anybody that's been in the business for a while knows that there used to be, you know, stacks and stacks of, you know, uh, manila envelopes in our office and we'd have millions of eight by tens uh, that, you know, we would always cringe when we figured out how are we going to recycle these things. Um, and now uh, it's easier because it's all in front of us on a computer, but it's still quite a lot of work. Um, so th 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 that's the big change. The big change is the fact that we're, we're, uh, we're not opening envelopes anymore, but we, now we have so many more submissions coming in than we used to. People that would never think about putting uh, you know, a, a 47 cent stamp on it or whatever they are to set a couple of bucks on, a, on an envelope now to send their picture and resume will submit in a second because if you're on Actors Access you can submit for free on, under certain parts of their, their 
of their business model. And uh, so we get tons and tons of submissions. So it's made our job, um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because it, so you see more photographs, you have to do more work, but you also have a lot more choices. So for us, it's, a, it's kind of a, a mixed blessing. Do you look at demo reels and what are the do's and don'ts? Yes, no more than three minutes. If you can separate them into drama and comedy, I'm a big fan of doing that. A minute a piece is great because it, what it does is it gives us an opportunity to, to be more specific when we're casting and you more specific when you're submitting if you're submitting for a drama or a comedy. Uh, always have your face be the first face <laughs> that we see. Can you share any stories? Oh, yeah, like about a thousand, where an actor will send me a video and I'm watching and I say, wow, this guy's great. And then they cut to the other actor who's got like two lines and that's the actor in that, that yeah. you know, who's th put your face first, uh, make sure that your name is the front first, you, you know, your name is actually on the thing. Uh, and then no montage, please. That used to be the style. Don't ever, don't ever do a montage. <laughs> because I, I, I'm sleeping by about 10 or 15 seconds into the montage. So. Um, and uh, uh, um, <coughs> make sure that it does, it's, it, the, good, the good stuff's up front. You know, don't put you know, your little clips where you got one or two lines or you know, up front. It, if you, if it's, there's not a, uh, you know, it has to be something that, that uh, catches us right away. And, and the, your, your good work, your, your, your uh, your talent is what we're looking for. So the good, best work you can put up front is the best. Can student films be used for demo Absolutely. Reels? Especially nowadays because, you know, AFM and, I mean, uh, um, AFI. AFI, and just like, because the AFM is last week. Uh, AFI and uh, AFI is amazing because they have amazing equipment. Uh, 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 USC Film School, um, New York Film Academy, uh, there can be some really great productions. I mean, the thing is, is, you always, when you're doing, when you're applying for or submitting for a, uh, a student film job, make sure that you know a little bit about the, the production. You know what kind of equipment they're using. You know what kind of a budget they're at. Uh, I mean, you don't have to know specific stuff, but it has to be the kind of thing where you know you're not going into, you know, a, a low rent, low budget thing where you're gonna look like crap where the sound is terrible and, the, and the, the camera work is terrible and the editing is terrible. So do a little bit of research on the filmmakers before you do that. Usually a, a thesis film uh, uh, is, a, is a, you know, you're gonna be okay because the, the, uh, the, the quality of the filmmakers and the equipment is, is good. So student films are great. What about creating content, web series, and sometimes now actors are producing and writing and creating? I think it's awesome. It's the new, it's the new Rocky. You know, I mean, it's the you know, if you think about Sylvester Stallone, if he had the internet now, uh, you know, when he was starting, he through the roof. And that's what's happening is a lot of people are are taking the model of creating your own project, sticking to the the the, the philosophy that that I'm taking my power back by creating what what. I want people, uh, how I want people to see me. Uh, and, uh, and being able to, to, uh, to just sort of control the whole process in a way that's beneficial to you as an actor. I think if you're a writer especially, um, you know, Billy Bob did it with, with Sling Blade, uh, and you know, won an Academy Award for it, by not compromising, by saying in the beginning of, of my career, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take control and write my own project, and star in my own project, and direct my own project. And uh, and so you can do that now with uh, with you know YouTube and Vimeo and Hulu and there there's all these platforms now where you can actually create content, you can make great stuff. I mean, it still has to be quality stuff. The fact is, there's a lot of crap out there. And as uh, as as much as as talented as you think you are, you have to compete with other really talented people out there. So if you're going to create that stuff, you want to make sure it's good enough to attract the attention of people that are eventually going to pay you and maybe turn it into something that's bigger and, and better. Please like our page, please share our page, please send in your questions for casting director Billy DeMota. This is from Facebook. 
I live in Atlanta, which I consider to be an emerging market. Should I stay here and get as much work as possible before I move to LA? What is your, what is your thinking on that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing, your work, you, if there's work there, stay there. Uh, when you come to Los Angeles, no matter how good you are, you're gonna be in a much bigger market with a lot more stuff going on, but there's gonna be a few million more people to compete with. So if you're working in a smaller market and you're getting great uh, jobs, you're getting good footage, you're putting a, a reel together, you're laying the foundation in a, in, in a way that you'll be able to use when you eventually do come to Los Angeles. But try to, and I tell every actor this, that you always have to jump through that gauntlet which is, uh, 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 which is, is getting your reel together because every casting director wants one, so every agent will say, let me see your reel, and uh, so the the earlier and, and the earlier that you can start putting together that foundation, which is your reel, that it's kind of show your work, uh, the better, and the more it'll help you in the long run when you come to Los Angeles, especially looking for representation here. Greg? This is from Aziz, who's one of our students, out in Facebook land. How do you reconcile wanting to work versus not wanting to play stereotypes? Integrity versus meeting. How and when do you say no? It's a personal decision. Aziz, you probably, because of your name, I'm assuming you're Middle, Middle Eastern. Eastern yes. You probably go out for a lot of terrorist roles, which a lot of Middle Eastern people do, uh, because that's what's out there. And if you don't want to play the stereotype, you tell your agent, don't submit me for that stuff. You, you personally have to make that decision. You know, I cast a TV show called America's Most Wanted for 20 years. And I always told the actor, I said, you're playing an axe murderer and you're Mexican. That doesn't mean that all Mexicans are axe murderers, but you're gonna be stereotyped as the, you know, the, the hubcap stealing gang member if you, you know, I don't tell them that specifically, but they understand the, the format of the show and, 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 and we try to explain that in a certain way so they, I don't want to ever, actors to ever feel like they have to work a, a, you know, a, a stereotype to be able to get work. But on the other hand, it started a lot of people's careers. So you have to be the judge, Aziz. You have to take a look at the project. You have to think, is this a kind of a cheesy project where I'm not, yeah, I'm gonna play a stereotype but I'm not really gonna, it, it doesn't do anything for my career or, or the integrity of the production is kind of sucky. Uh, so you have to really do your research before you say yes and sign on the dotted line to, to be able to, uh, to do those things. But, you know, it's a personal decision, right? So this is from Facebook. What do you think the key is to longevity for an actor? Uh, I was going to say, the key to longevity is longevity. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I, I, there are far too many actors that I've met in my life that say, I'm going to give it a year and see how it goes. <laughs> you know, and then after a year, they're like ready to blow their freaking head off um, because they haven't gotten a job or they haven't gotten an agent. They the key to longevity, first of all, is to be prepared. Before you come to Los Angeles, make sure that you understand how this business works because you don't want to spend the first three years of your life here learning how the business works because everything will be passing you up. Also, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, training, but I think that if you're, if you're, if you're in a six-year drama program at some school in the Midwest, you're missing out on the work here when there are great teachers and great training here. And I'm not disparaging the university system in the United States. Yes, I am. But, <laughs> but be here. Get here when you're ready to be here. If, you're, if, you've, if you've laid a foundation, you've done some work in your hometown, you've done your research about the, 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 the business, the agents, about managers, you still won't know it all, but you'll know more than you know than most people who just get off the bus know. So be prepared, uh, and uh, be prepared for uh, the long haul. Um, you know, have uh, a lot of money <laughs> uh, to, uh, to. I say, uh, 
Uh, but then you probably wouldn't want to be in Hollywood. You probably want to be in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so just be prepared to to, to be here and and uh, and and struggle for a while. But uh, the, and and don't get disappointed when things don't happen overnight. Now that that goes with this. This is also also from Facebook. Do you have any advice about how to handle rejection? Oh man. <laughs> That's so, it's so hard because I'm an emotional guy and you know, when I don't get a casting job that I really want, I, I get disappointed. But I also just let it go. And I think actors, you know, I work at a, at a facility at Sherman Oaks and the elevator has got these kind of aluminum walls, you know, kind of shining them and they're big dents in the walls. And I think it's because actors banging their heads on their way back to their the parking lot after their audition. You have to let it go. You have to you have to go in, do your best work, and then forget about it. Because there's nothing you can do to change it. And if you can't change it, you're only going to make yourself crazy by thinking about it and obsessing about it. Uh, so you will. So that's. That, that's the first part of it. Then if you get rejected, you just have to get back in the saddle and do it again. Unless you, there's a problem with your training and your approach to the way you're, you're auditioning and you're doing everything right, it's just a numbers game. You have to just keep getting in, 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 in behind the wheel and, and, and driving that thing home because you're gonna, eventually, somebody's gonna see you and like you and hire you. But it doesn't happen on every audition, and it, and it, you know, and it doesn't happen as often as any actor would like. But you just got to keep plugging away uh, and let go of the stuff you can't control. Do you give feedback to the agents and the managers about the actors if they ask for it? Uh, I don't call. Uh, I mean, we see way too many actors, so I don't call them and uh, and, and give them specific feedback unless. <laughs> Unless it's a special occasion where the actor comes in and does something really weird or, or wrong. Um, well, what are some of those? <laughs> for the first thing is is the just being completely unprepared for a lead in a in a movie. Uh, you know, I uh, Dee and I cast a, a movie called God's Not Dead, and um, and so the guy came in. And producer and director there. And if anybody knows about God's Not Dead, it's Pure Flix, and it's a Christian production company. The actor decided to use every F-bomb in the world just as part of, the dialogue was, was, yeah, I'm not going to that stupid, I'm not getting in the stupid car with you. Instead it became, I'm not getting in the car with you. And, uh, and the, the, you can see the kind of producers like, <laughs> the more he said the F word, it was like, and, so, and I had to call the agent and I said, does he know that this is a Christian project? And no, it is, he didn't have any, he was just being, so there are times when, uh, when you have to be, you have to really understand what you're reading for. When you, when you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chaz is there. What makes an actor stand out in an audition? Yeah, not in that way, but I think he means the positive way. Um, <laughs> just being really prepared. I mean, we talked about it before, so sort of like the things I don't like it when you're unprepared. When, um, Do you want them to have it memorized? No. You don't need to have it memorized. I, and here's the reason I say that. It's because in my, the, the, the scope of my career, the times when, they, when actors come in and they have it memorized and they're doing their scene, probably 40, 50% forget their lines in the middle of the audition because they're so confident. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't need to say that. And then there's that moment where they go up and it's like, oh. And then you can see that look in their eyes. And now, no matter how they start over, they're thinking about how they screwed up the, the first part of the audition. So. Always have your sides with you, I think. Um, uh, there also what it does is it tells us, and the director, producer, whoever's in the room, 
but this is still an audition. It's not a performance level uh, reading. You have the audition, you have, you have the sides somewhere else, and it looks like you're performing, and then sometimes the producer and director think that's all we get. So it gives us the opportunity to redirect you. It's just a, it's a it's sort of a, a mind thing, you know. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> what makes an actor stand up? Well, let us take that, the ability to take direction. Right. Uh, yes. And Have some, you seen someone become defensive? Or? Uh, yes, I've had, we were just talking about this the other day where, you know, when an actor comes in to read for me, what I do sometimes is I will say to the actor, uh, I'll give them a little, uh, sort of a, a synopsis of what's going on in the scene. I know they've read the script, and they, uh, but you know, maybe, yeah, because I've been sitting with the director all day or the producer all day, there's certain things they want to see, a certain direction they want to go in, and I'll and I'll let them know, you know. So I was telling a woman. So in this scene, what's happening is that she comes in to the diner, and when she sits down, you know, he comes in. She doesn't expect to see him, and is a little freaked out. And and the woman with the producer and director there said to me, "I read the freaking script. I oh know. God. I know what's going on." <laughs> Don't tell me how to do my work or something like that. <laughs> this is an actor I know too, and uh, wow, you feel like sorry. So, <laughs> oh, was it you? No, it wasn't. You. <laughs> no, it wasn't you, Denise. <laughs> so, so, the, so, yeah. Don't argue with the casting director when you are in uh, when you're in an audition, especially with the producer and director there, uh, and. Here's the ironic thing. Later in the day, because she's a friend of mine, she called me. She goes, "How did I do?" Oh God! And I told her, and for some reason, I got defriended from her Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> don't yell at the casting director, and don't, don't, you know. I mean, I think she did it because she was nervous and because she knew me. But the, when she walked out of the room, the director and the producer both said, "What was that?" So, so that's know, standing out, not so the good. What was that is not something you want. To <laughs> that's not really. Billy, what do you want to leave us with? Anything mm -hmm. that you want to share? Let me say this. There are a lot of reasons we're all in this room today. A lot of reasons we came to Los Angeles. I see my friends here, uh, and I. I know a lot of your hearts and a lot of your your dreams and a lot of your I know what you aspire to and I want you to know I know how hard it is for what you do I know every day what you go through and I hurt with you and I cry with you and I am and I feel your pain let me let's go back for a second think about why, uh, think about the first time you decided you wanted to do this nutty thing. Think about, think about the time you were seven years old and you were singing in the parlor with your grandmother playing piano and the family was around at Christmas time and they were all cheering. And think about that feeling. Think about the way it felt to have people watching you and admiring you and your talent and your, 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 your spirit that was filling that room. Think about the day, remember that, that elementary school play where you played the stupid tree in Charlie Brown's <laughs> Christmas? And how excited you were to get up on that stage and nobody could see your face, but you knew your mom and dad were out there and you knew your, your aunt and uncle were out there and you knew your brothers and you just were so excited when you were backstage thinking about going on, hobbling on the stage with this. That feeling. Think about the time you were playing uh, guitar in your, in, your, in your junior high school band and you got up on the stage and or playing drums and that first time that girl looked back at you and said, he's cute. <laughs> Think about the way it felt when you got to sit back there and rock and roll and affect an audience. That's why we're all here right now today. That's why we're in this room. That's why we're in this city. That's why we're in this business. That feeling can never go away. No matter how old you get, no matter how many movies you do or how successful you become, that feeling is what drove you to this point. 
and is what will continue to drive you forward from this point on. So if you can't have that feeling, if you can't keep that feeling, if you can't um, embrace that feeling and share it with other people, then go sell shoes <laughs> or cars or wait tables or do something else that, that you're happy with. Don't be a rock in the road. That's what I call people that don't have the dream and don't live for the dream every single day. They're rocks in the road and they're just obstacles for the rest of us to kind of have to get around. But I think everybody in this room, and I'm sure everybody in this room has that dream and, and, and wants it bad. Another thing I'll say before we close is that this town is a hard <coughs> town. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of people that will scream and yell and, and make you feel like you're worthless. We all have to take care of each other. A rising tide lifts all boats. The more we help each other, the more we help ourselves. You're doing great, and I'm doing great. And remember, I, I don't have a job without you, and you don't have a job without me. So let's help each other, let's watch out for each other, let's lift each other up instead of standing on each other's shoulders to try to get over that that uh, proverbial wall of success before the others. And uh, I think we'll all be more happy for it. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Me.